All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I'd like to thank uh, the students from uh, St. Peter's University in New Jersey who are attending. Welcome to the briefing. This morning at COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, the Secretary General met separately with members, states of the European Union, members of the groups of 77 and China, the European Commission Vice President Franz Timmermans, and Xi Xinhua, China's Special Climate Envoy. As the negotiations draw to a close, the Secretary General urged parties to aim for maximum ambition on loss and damage and in reduction of emissions. The Secretary General will continue intensive consultations with parties over the course of the day. Yesterday, the Secretary General had a phone call with Vladimir Zelensky, the President of Ukraine. They discussed the future of the Black Sea Grain Initiative and ways to improve its impact in the least developed countries. I've been asked in recent days about the violence in Iran, and I can say that we are deeply worried about growing violence related to the ongoing popular protests in Iran. We condemn all incidents that have resulted in death or serious injury, including the shooting in the city of Izeh on the 16th of November, 2022. We are also concerned about the reported issuance of death sentences against five unnamed individuals in the context of the latest protests. We underline that the authorities must respect their obligations under international human rights law, including in particular with regard to the human rights of women and the rights to peaceful assembly, freedom of expression, and freedom of association. In that context, we reiterate that the security forces must avoid all disproportionate use of force against peaceful protesters. Those responsible must be held accountable. We also appeal to protesters to act in a peaceful manner. All efforts must be made to avoid further escalation. We urge the authorities to address the legitimate grievances of the population and immediately release thousands of individuals being arbitrarily held for their involvement in peaceful demonstrations. The current crisis in Iran can and should be addressed through peaceful dialogue. We encourage all good faith, meaningful efforts in this regard and stand ready to support if requested. Turning to Ukraine, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that power outages continue to impact millions of people across the country as temperatures are plummeting below zero and snow is falling in many parts of the country, including in the capital, Kiev. Authorities say that some 10 million households across Ukraine, and this includes families, businesses and services, including hospitals, were without electricity yesterday evening, an increase from around 2 million yesterday morning. Nearly 70% of households in the southern Odessa region have not had electricity since November 15th. In Kharkiv, power cuts continued as well, including in areas where we know people are already facing dire needs. For example, in the city of Kupyansk, which was retaken by Ukraine a few months ago, most people there have no water, electricity, or heating right now. Our humanitarian colleagues note that the attacks that are ca causing this serious energy crisis are also claiming lives, causing injuries, and destroying homes. According to our partners in the region of Zaporizhia, a strike hit an apartment building yesterday in a town close to the front line, killing many civilians while they were sleeping. In Dnipro, another strike left more than 20 civilians injured and their homes destroyed. Humanitarian workers are doing as much as possible to, to provide support. The World Health Organization, the International Organization for Migration, the UN Children's Fund, and the UN Refugee Agency are providing generators to hospitals and displacement centers. Yesterday, for example, UNHCR sent two generators to Zaporizhka Oblast to support heating sites set up by authorities. In Dnipro, a UN-supported national NGO provided emergency shelter kits to 45 families who, whose apartments were damaged during yesterday's strike and also provided psychological assistance. Turning to Pakistan, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that more than three months since the devastating floods began, the catastrophe is far from over. You're aware that the floods have affected 33 million people and caused destruction across the economy, the agricultural, health, and education sectors. More than 5 million people remain displaced. Food and livelihoods assistance has reached 4.1 million people, while 1.5 million people have received emergency shelter kits, blankets, bedding, and kitchen sets. Our partners have provided health assistance to 1.5 million people, while more than 1.7 million people have received clean water. Access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene remain challenging, with the flooding and standing water having led to a rise in water and vector-borne diseases. Millions of people face increased food insecurity as families are returning home to destroyed houses, ruined crops, 
and dead livestock. As winter begins to set in, with snow already affecting some, pe some areas, people affected by the floods are even more vulnerable and many need adequate shelter, food, and winterization support. We're calling for additional funding to maintain the life-saving response. The $816 million humanitarian appeal launched by the United Nations and the government of Pakistan is currently just 21% funded. Today, the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Izumi Nakamitsu, spoke on behalf of the Secretary General at a ceremony in Dublin, Ireland, for the adoption of the political declaration on strengthening the protection of civilians from the humanitarian consequences arising from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. She noted that this political declaration marks a milestone and collective efforts to better protect civilians from the increasing urbanization of armed conflict. Ms. Nakamitsu stressed that we cannot always stop conflicts from happening, but we can take steps to protect the people caught in the midst of these crises. She called on all to ensure that this declaration is not an end in itself, but the next critical step in our journey to lasting peace. In a statement issued today, the humanitarian coordinator for Nigeria, Matthias Schmel, said that yesterday's killing of a staff member of the humanitarian non-governmental organization Medicine du Mans in Damboa, Borno State, is deeply disturbing and sad. On behalf of the United Nations, Mr. Schmel conveyed his heartfelt condolences to the aid worker's family and to her colleagues. He also wished a speedy recovery to a pilot working with the UN Humanitarian Air Service who was injured in the deplorable attack by an apparently rogue soldier. Mr. Schmel stressed that all humanitarian staff working in Northeast Nigeria deserve our fullest respect for their courage and commitment to stay and deliver life-saving assistance to people in need in often difficult and dangerous circumstances. Humanitarian workers must be protected, he said. Mr. Schmel lauded the government and the military's efforts to speedily investigate yesterday's incident and urged them to strengthen remedial measures to prevent similar in incidents in the future. Also today, Mr. Schmel announced $10.5 million in new funding for the flood response in Nigeria. As, as, you may notice, as you may recall, that Nigeria is facing unprecedented flooding with more than 4.4 million people affected across the country and 2.4 million displaced. This new funding from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund and the Nigeria Humanitarian Fund will provide clean water, sanitation, health care, shelter, and non-food items for people in the most affected states, including in the northeast of the country, where people are reeling from the combined impacts of floods, protracted conflict, rising hunger, and a cholera outbreak. As discussions at the Climate Change Conference in Egypt draw to a close, the flooding in Nigeria is yet another reminder that climate change has a devastating impact on already poor and vulnerable people and will continue to determine their ability to survive unless urgent action is taken. The UN Refugee Agency has released today an updated return advisory for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, reiterating its call for a ban on forced returns, including of asylum seekers who have had their claims rejected, to the eastern provinces of North Kivu, South Kivu, and Ituri. UNHCR said that it is concerned about a rise in attacks on civilians, including those residing in states for displaced people in the east of the country. Since the beginning of 2022, UNHCR has recorded more than 50,000 violations against the rights of the civilian population, including refugees and internally displaced people. According to UNHCR, since the 20th of October, 188,000 people have been newly displaced by fighting between the M23 rebel group and the Congolese army. Even before the latest spike in displacement, an estimated 5.6 million Congolese were internally displaced. Another 1 million have found refuge in 22 countries in Africa, making it one of the world's largest humanitarian crises. We have good news from our UN team in Brazil, led by resident coordinator Silvia Rux, as they just launched this week at COP27 a new financing scheme to promote sustainable development of the Brazilian Amazon. The new UN multi-partner trust fund for sustainable development in the legal Amazon is an innovative mechanism to mobilize resources to benefit the most vulnerable population in the Amazon. It will boost sustainable livelihoods, protecting means and ways of life, helping generate, guarantee uh, physical health, energy, climate, and food security. This new fund is a partnership between our team in Brazil and the Interstate Consortium of the Legal Amazon, which gathers the local governments of nine Brazilian states. The Brazilian Amazon is home to 12% of the country's population and covers nearly 60% of its territory. Ms. Rux highlighted the focus on the Amazon population to help communities manage their ecosystem, creating inclusive economic activities. Working with local authorities, a top priority will be environmental governance to reduce illegal activities and support sustainable settlements and cities. 
Moving to Haiti, the International Organization for Migration is urgently appealing for $3.2 million to continue responding to a deadly cholera outbreak in Haiti and the dire situation of the displaced population in the country. IOM notes that the cholera resurgence aids, adds further stress to a complex humanitarian situation amidst a, vi- a volatile social political environment marked by road blockages, fuel shortages, violent gang activity, and rampant insecurity, restricting the delivery of basic services, including access to water and health care. According to IOM, more than 96,000 people have been displaced by recent gang violence in Port au Prince. Through this appeal, IOM will continue working with the Ministry of Public Health and other partners to ensure continued essential services, including risk communication and community engagement, strengthening its early warning system, providing mental health and psychosocial support, and supplying clean and safe water to displacement sites. In a report published ahead of World Children's Day, marked on the 20th of November, the UN Children's Fund noted that racism and discrimination against children based on their ethnicity, language, and religion are rife in countries across the world. The report shows that children from marginalized groups in an an analysis of 22 low- and middle-income countries lag far behind their peers in reading skills. UNICEF pointed out that on average, students aged 7 to 14 from the most advantaged groups are more than twice as likely to have foundational reading skills than those from the least advantaged group. Also today, UNICEF said that children across the Middle East and North Africa are facing yet another rise in violence. Since the beginning of this year, nearly 580 children have been killed in conflict or violence across several countries in the region, an average of more than 10 children every week. Many more have been injured. And today marks the first World Day for the preservation of and the he- and healing from child sexual exploitation, abuse, and violence. Sunday is World Day of Remembrance for Road Traffic Victims. In a message for the day, the Secretary General notes that every year 1.3 million people die in road accidents and 50 million more are injured. He points out that one of the best ways to remember and honor the victims is by doing our part to make roads safer around the world. And Sunday is also the Africa Industrialization Day. In his message for the day, the Secretary General warns that countries across Africa are facing a perfect storm, armed conflicts, rising food and energy insecurity, skyrocketing inflation and debt, shrinking fiscal space, and mounting climate catastrophes. Yet despite these challenges, he says, Africa includes some of the world's fastest growing economies with the potential to lead in the global energy transition. The Secretary General calls on all to join forces to build a more sustainable, peaceful, and prosperous continent for all. And that is it for me. Are there any questions? Yes, Natalia. Thank you, Farhan. I just, uh, you said that Mr. Guterres and Ukrainian president had talked yesterday about the future of Black uh, Ukraine Crane Initiative. Could you please just put more light on that, what they have specifically discussed? And could you please just remind me why this deal was prolonged only till the 19th of March for four months, not for the year as we all were hoping? Uh, well, at this stage, the nature of the deal is such uh, that it is essentially programmed to renew for four-month periods unless the parties, any of the parties, objects to it. In this case, as you know, uh, the parties accepted, all of them accepted the extension, and so it extends, and uh, hopefully it will continue to do so uh, in each, uh, at the end of each of these periods. Uh, and regarding their discussions, the, the basic point is that we want to make sure that the sort of uh, uh, food aid that is being uh, uh, s- uh, shipped across the Black Sea through the initiative uh, is, uh, is able to not only ease world food prices, which is important, but uh, also to provide relief, uh, a maximum amount of relief for, for least developed countries. And just one more question about the energy system of Ukraine. Today, the Prime Minister of Ukraine, Denis Mugal, he announced that Russian rockets targeted like 50% of energy system supplies objects in Ukraine. How it's going to affect the UN um, mission in Ukraine in terms, not like work of the UN, but the help of UN to Ukraine? Thank well, you. Well, we're doing as much as we can to uh, make sure that the necessary functions uh, of uh, different uh, key 
facilities in Ukraine are able to continue. Uh, as I pointed out, one of the ways we're doing that is by providing generators, and, and we'll tr continue to try to do what we can to make sure that, uh, that the sort of um, attacks on civilian infrastructure, which, as you know, we have repeatedly uh, uh, opposed, uh, do not uh, prevent uh, a Ukrainian society uh, from functioning properly. So basically, if, if we need more generators, we're going to get them. Uh, yeah, as, as well as other ways of providing support. Uh, uh, for example, in different areas, we'll need to be able to provide winterization support, uh, and, and that's uh, crucial at a time when, uh, certainly without uh, regular heating, uh, that there's, uh, there's a, a real problem making sure that people are safe and sheltered. Thank you. I'm just coming back to Kyiv. I was just worried. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, oh, uh, for first Edie and then and then Deji. Um, first, a, a, a follow up on what Natalia asked. Um, in in the Secretary General's talks with uh, President Zelensky, uh, did he address the issues, for instance, of the? Uh, huge backlog of ships uh, waiting to go through um, the Black Sea inspection process. This was going on in the past mm -hmm. few weeks. Uh, I don't have further details to share on the phone call. What I can say is that uh, certainly this is something that we have been taking very seriously. Our joint coordination center in Istanbul is uh, working hard to expedite the process by which uh, uh, the inspections are carried out and and approvals are granted, so that uh, more of the ships can be uh, be moving. And if you've looked at our updates, uh, the, there is motion of ships, and we're doing as much as we can to clear the backlog. And um, can you give us an update on um, world? food program ships and where they are heading to developing countries. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, next week we do expect a World Food Program ship uh, that uh, uh, will be carrying uh, fertilizer uh, from uh, the Netherlands to make its way first uh, to Mozambique and then from there inland uh, to Malawi. And so we'll uh, get you information on that as that proceeds. But the, but the World Food Program has been providing information on that on their website. And of course, uh, uh, the daily register of ships moving on the Black Sea is, is put out by our colleagues at the Joint Coordination Center. Right, but that doesn't exactly give um, all of the detailed information of exactly the final destinations. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, a lot of it goes to interim de destinations, but, uh, but they do m mark which ones are World Food Program ships, and, and the World Food Program puts out that information right. as well. My, my question was that as COP27 is heading to a conclusion, um, we know that the Secretary General had a series of meetings with different groups. How involved is he in trying to get agreement on a final text. Well, you've heard what the Secretary General has had to say. He's, he's, he's pushing the parties. Ultimately, we need governments themselves to go the extra mile, and, and that is what he's been encouraging. I'd refer you to his remarks from yesterday that we shared, but what he's trying to do is make sure that they have maximum ambition, in particular maximum ambition on loss and damage, and on reduction of emissions. Those are the things he's uh, focusing on, and he's been meeting uh, with different, uh, different officials, and he will continue to, to do uh, his utmost while he's on the ground in Sharm el-Sheikh. Yeah, Deji? Farhan, I'm going to have some follow-ups only. Uh, Adi basically asked the question I want to ask. So first, on the, on the phone call of uh, the Secretary General with the President of Ukraine, uh, they discussed the ways to improve the impact of the least developed countries of, you know, Black Sea Green Deal. Do, do, did they have any conclusion on that, the ways, how to improve the situation? Uh, in terms of how the, uh, the deal can be approved, obviously we're very receptive 
to make sure that the parties themselves can discuss and agree on that. Uh, uh, any changes would have to be part of an agreement by the parties to the deal itself. And, uh, and certainly, we, we would encourage the process by which they work with each other and with us to improve it. So can I, can I understand this like um, the Secretary General talked to Mr. Zelensky about how they imagined the, a enhanced initiative would be? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't add more to the readout that we've given. Okay. What what I would say is uh, you'll have seen that the Secretary General did speak with President Zelensky. He spoke uh, just a, a little while earlier with the the Russian Federation's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and this is part and parcel of his efforts to make sure that uh, the grain deal and the and the deal on Russian food and fertilizer exports not only remain on track, but, but can be as effective as possible. Have they talked about something else, for example, the escalation recently in Ukraine? Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there would have been other topics of discussion, but I, I wouldn't go beyond what I have. Okay, my second part is COP27. Uh, we know today that uh, COP27 actually uh, the closing date has been delayed, and God knows when. And but basically, um, when you you have already talked that Secretary General want to have the urge the the world leaders have the maximum ambition, especially on the loss and damage. But it seems the the final text there's problem with the loss and damage found. Like some some agree, some disagree. Uh, what's the expectation and? More importantly, how much compromise can can Secretary General accept to have the have the final text? Given the fact that last year in in Glasgow they also compromised quite a lot on the final text. Well, all of these agreements are the result of of compromise, and we understand the level of compromise that's needed. At the same time, uh, the Secretary General has made clear what uh, what the needs are, what the baseline needs of the international community are. Uh, again, I'd refer you to what he said yesterday, the remarks that we shared on that. There's a level at which we need to make sure that the planet that we live on will continue to be livable. And that is something uh, that, uh, that has a certain baseline expectation. Uh, but certainly... This agreement, like all, will be the result of compromise, and we hope that that compromise will still result in the strongest possible uh, affirmation of our, of our efforts uh, to, to put a halt uh, to global warming. Yes, Evelyn. Thank you, Svarhan. Um, on the Amazon, is there any... Uh, are there expectations that the election of Lula will improve the situation? Did, did they say, did the UN staff there say anything? Or does one not know yet? Well, we'll wait and see for, uh, for the inauguration of the next president. But certainly, we would, uh, we would uh, uh, hope that all countries, including Brazil, will enhance their climate ambitions. And along, that, along those lines, uh, uh, I would just remind you of what I said earlier uh, about uh, the good news that we have on a new financing scheme to promote sustainable development of the Brazilian Amazon. But that wasn't the case under Bolsonaro. Well, th 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 that's an agreement that's been reached uh, right now. And, uh, and, uh, and as you know, he's, he's president right now. Uh, I have one more statement. Sure. Um, this is the last day you'll see Natalia. In fact, any of us from the Dag Hammarskjöld Fund for Journalists. And uh, you're going to miss us, but we will certainly miss you. I'll be off next week also. Oh, well, yeah. And, uh, and I'd like to once more thank all of the, um, all of the Dag Hammarskjöld fellows uh, this year. Thank, thank you all for, for enlivening the briefing. Natalia, you have to stand in for, for your colleagues on this one. Um, and uh, let's turn to the screens. Abdul Hamid. Thank you, Farhan. Um, you are aware of the 21 Palestinians killed in a fire in uh, Jabalia refugee camp in the besieged Gaza Strip. I saw the statement of condolences by Mr. Winsland. But my question is how much the 
Israeli occupation and siege, which had been placed on Gaza since 2007, bear some responsibility about these tragedies in Gaza. Well, regarding that, it's, it's uh, clear that uh, the causes of the fire would need to be investigated, and we hope that there will be accountability uh, once the, the causes for that are determined. And with that, I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Paulina Kubiak, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>